So I called Jeff and Jaren, set up a meeting. They had no idea who I was, but we set up a meeting and I told them who I was. And I said, I want to talk to you about your contract. And so we set up a meeting in a hotel circle in San Diego in a private room. So nobody would see us having lunch together. Jeff and Jerry got to the meeting early and left a note on the table in the room. And then they left. <laughs> what did the note say? I got there right, at, right on time. And I walked in and there's a note on there saying, if this is the way you're going to treat your talent, we want nothing to do with it. Love Jeff and Jerry. <laughs> and that was all that was in there. And I got there right on time. And I'm going... Where is it? <laughs> they walked in about a minute. They left me there for about a minute and walked in a minute later just cracking up. <laughs> Ben's Town President Dave Chachi Dennis loves radio and all of his radio friends. Hey, Chachi. Hey, everybody. Because Chachi loves everybody. <laughs> really excited to welcome honestly, my very first mentor and the person widely responsible for getting me into the business along with Michael Steele. He's recognized as one of America's most innovative radio programmers and managers. He was named Radio Inc.'s best programmer in America in 1998. His broad background in traditional and digital media has led him to consult over 200 radio stations in 15 countries. He's also authored three books and sold them in over 40 countries. Uh, please welcome the CEO of Tracy Johnson Media Group, Tracy Johnson, also known as AKA Set Director Tracy Johnson. <laughs> hey, Chachi, thank you for having me on. It's, uh, it's great to hear you and see you. Uh, likewise. Thanks so much, man, for joining me. This is absolutely an honor, and I owe you so much for my career. You're the first person really to uh, take a chance on me, along with Michael, and we'll go into that in a little bit because I've got a whole section about uh, Star 100.7, and I'm really excited to talk about that. But you're also responsible for introducing me to my partners, Andy and Ollie, uh, in Germany. And if it weren't for you, I wouldn't be in the business. And if it weren't for you, Benstown probably never would have been born. So thank you so much for everything you've done uh, for my career. It's greatly appreciated. Well, that's very nice of you to say, but I think it uh, comes down more to your creativity and ingenuity and uh, determination and positive attitude that you, you make your own breaks. Uh, if I'm instrumental in, in uh, helping make those breaks happen, I'm proud of that, but you make your own breaks and that's what you've done. Thanks, man. I, I appreciate that. But uh, w without a doubt, uh, you've given me so many opportunities and thank you. And for so many opportunities you've given to a, a lot of people in the industry, and we'll talk some bit, a bit about that in a, in a moment. But first, I'd love to hear about you growing up in your childhood. I grew up in a uh, farming community in central Nebraska, uh, just outside of a little town called Ord, O-R-D, which uh, I would venture to say that more than 99% of the people listening to this at any time have never heard of Ord. Yeah, I have not. <laughs> <laughs> right out in the middle of the state, a town of a uh, little over 2,000 people. My, my uh, family were, was farmers. I didn't go over the farm life that much. So when I was 14, I uh, went to the radio uh, general manager of the local hometown radio station, little AM 1000 watt station, and uh, said, I want to do what you do someday. And he said, why don't you start tomorrow? <laughs> he was looking. What was, yeah. what was your first gig? <laughs> he was on the air that afternoon. I went in and he uh, showed me, he let me watch him for an hour, explained everything that was going on and uh, said, okay, next hour is all yours. I'll be back in my office if you have any questions. No way. So you were fresh in a radio station. You hadn't even been there an hour and he put you on the air like that? Yeah, just, a, <laughs> just an hour into the radio station. He said, here's, uh, show me, here's how you play all the commercials. Here's all the uh, songs. Play anything you want and um, I'll be back in the back. If you, if you need me. That's incredible. What was the <laughs> format of the radio station? It was uh, all over the place. Uh, you could, you, it was literally the personality on the air could play anything they wanted to. Oh my gosh. And, and well, within reason. I mean, you can't come in and just start playing uh, album tracks that are, that are weird. It is a small farming community. And if I were a good programmer at the time, I would have played a lot of traditional country like Conway Twitty and <laughs> Loretta Lynn and Tanya Tucker back in the day. This is back in the mid 70s. But I was a, a high school kid and I was playing the hits. I was playing Queen <laughs> and uh, <laughs> playing my favorite song. So it, literally every time a different personality came on that station, the format changed. No kidding. Because they, you, could play, you could play anything that you wanted. That actually sounds like a, a fun radio station to listen to. I kind of wish more stations were like that. It was very hometown. It was a full service station. Uh, we had the, the Tradio show on every day for an hour <laughs> where people called in with things they had to buy, sell, or trade. I started hosting that when I was 15. No kid. How did that work? Well, you would uh, open it. We called it party line. Okay. 
So anybody who had something they wanted to buy, sell, or trade, they would call and we would take their phone number and then hook them up with somebody who uh, wanted to buy, sell, or trade with them. No kidding. We did that for an hour a day. And then the second hour was a talk show. We called it Party Line Part 2, where you could call and sound off about anything that you wanted. So here I am, a 15-year-old kid that doesn't know anything, <laughs> talking to these people with opinions. And then after that, we played, I played music for a while. So from, from that time, I, yeah, I, I started going in and putting the station on the air. It was a, a, a daytime-only signal. So we had a license that when the sun came up, we could go on. We'd go on at sunrise. We'd go off at sunset. So in the winter, we came on late and went off early. We'd go off the air at 5 o'clock in the afternoon during the winter. But during the summer, we'd be on at like 4.30 in the morning until almost 10 o'clock at night. Oh, that's wild. I would do the morning show. I, I went in before I went to school, uh, put the station on the air, and I'd stay on until about 8 o'clock and go to school. And then I'd come over to the station again as soon as school was out, and I'd stay on the air until it went off every day. Man, so it was like in your blood from, uh, from the get-go. That way, yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. Were your parents supportive? Oh, they, well, uh, my dad used to say, um, uh, I can't believe you want to go sit in a room all day long and do nothing but play the same songs over and over. <laughs> and my response was, dad, I can't believe that you want to go out into the same field and drive a tractor up and down the same road day after day uh, all the time because I didn't get the whole farming thing. <laughs> And so we agreed to disagree, and he, he said, okay, well, if you're not going to work on the farm, and if you're not going to help me out here, then you'll be paying for your own clothes and your own food and your own gas. And he said, you know, so from the time I was 15, I was basically on my own. They let me stay at the house for free, which was nice. He was definitely tough love. Work ethic was incredibly important to him, it sounds like. Yeah, um, I, and I, I think he was doing that to say, you know, you'll get tired of this radio thing and you'll come back and you'll help me on the farm <laughs> again. And I'm going to help you do it by making you pay for everything. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't work out for him. He would have liked you to have followed in his footsteps and continue to manage the farm. Well, he was disappointed that I have an older brother who didn't like the farm either. And he left and went into, uh, coaching and he, he, he moved out right after uh, right after high school and became a baseball coach oh wow and so so I was his last hope uh, we have we had a sister too that uh, uh, was in between us and um, you know she obviously wasn't equipped to uh, work on the farm so I was his last hope of keeping the farm in the family <laughs> oh man it didn't work I'm out for him I'm sure though he had to uh, eventually have been proud of your decision and was he able to see you kind of rise through the ranks and no he passed away uh, when I was was 18. I just turned 18 oh, and man. he passed away. He had, um, he had cancer, uh, lymphoma that, uh, came on, it was discovered late and came on very quickly and he, and he passed away. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Was that tough for you? Uh, a little bit. Uh, it was surprising. You know, I mean, I, I was, um, pretty much raising myself by that time, really from the time I was 15, 16, um, I get up before my parents did and go to work and I'd get home after they were in bed. So I didn't see them very much. In fact, I, re I remember uh, it was a two weeks before I started college uh, in, the, in the middle of August. And my parents sat me down and said, we kind of need to know what your plans are for this fall. I said, oh, I'm going to the University of Nebraska at Kearney. I start in two weeks. <laughs> that was the first they knew of it. <laughs> Amazing. So said, were, oh, okay. <laughs> and what are you going to do there? I'm, well, I had a baseball scholarship. Did you really? Yeah, I went to the University of Nebraska Kearney on a baseball scholarship, and they had no idea I had even gone there to visit with them. I had been talking to the coaches. Yeah, I mean, it was it was not a bad relationship at all. It was just <laughs> kind of disassociated, I guess. That's fascinating. But it sounds like you, from a young age, were definitely driven. I mean, a lot of kids are kind of their parents have to urge them to go into school or to get a job, and this were, these were all things that you really wanted to do on your own. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I've, I've never been one to sit around and uh, wait for something to happen. I like to make things happen. Yeah. No, I think that's an incredible uh, spirit and, and trait. I know your work ethic and it's always been just uh, the, during the time I've known you which is now 20 almost 25 years which blows my mind but you work uh, so incredibly hard and I, I love your entrepreneurial spirit before
Before we get on to the rest of your career, what is it with Nebraska? So many talented broadcasters have come out of there, and I feel I know uh, Charlie Tuna was from there. Uh, uh, Johnny Carson, I believe, came from Nebraska. Michael Steele went through there. Dan Kiley went through there. Just so many talented. Uh, Ken Benson came through. John Ivey. Oh, John Ivey. Um, John Ivey was the music director at KQKQ in Omaha when I first met him uh, many years ago. It just feels like per capita, more successful broadcasters go through Nebraska than any other uh, state, at least by population. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, I, what I've been told is that Nebraska is a great breeding ground for announcers, for personalities, because it is the most nondescript accent in the United States. Oh, no kidding. In fact, one of the bigger industries in Omaha is telemarketing. Because where the 800 call centers come through, because the people there have a a flat accent. It's not it's not flavored by anything. It's not like the Northeast or the South or uh, even the West Coast. Sure. So they look for people that don't have uh, big accents. That's wild. I had never heard that before, but that makes a lot of sense. But it is amazing to me, just, uh, you know, the Nebraska Radio Hall of Fame, uh, Todd and Tyler, who we work with, just got inducted last year. So uh, a great state for broadcasters. So you go to uh, University of Nebraska in Kearney, their Kearney campus. Are you still working at that hometown radio station or was this too far? To- yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Went to Kearney for a year. So I worked, uh, Kearney was about two and a half hours away from my hometown. And so I would take classes that got me out on Friday afternoon and I would get back in order to be on the air Friday night. I did the uh, high school football, basketball and baseball games. Oh my gosh. So you were doing play by play, man, you were really uh, multi-talented. So, so, so I would go back and do the play by play and then I'd be on the air most of the day, Saturday and about half the day on Sunday and then go back to school on Sunday night. Oh my gosh. Except during baseball season, during baseball season, I wasn't able to do that all the time, depending on what the team was doing. Okay. And your boss, I assume was understanding because you were playing ball. Yeah. Oh, well, he'd take, he'd take anything that I would give him. So, <laughs> and then, but, but I only went to Kearney for a year. And is that when you went to Kansas city? No, I went to uh, Lincoln. I went, I, I transferred from the university of Nebraska, Kearney, the university of Nebraska, Lincoln, Lincoln and, and finished, uh, finished college there. And that's the main campus, right? I know there's Lincoln, Omaha, Kearney, because there's a few a few different campuses. Yeah, and there might be one or two more, but uh, those are the three main ones, yeah. Got it. So you went to Lincoln, and did you go there to be at the bigger school, or did you go because of a radio job? I thought I was uh, going to be the next great uh, pitcher in the major leagues, because at Kearney, they gave me a scholarship and put me on the varsity team as a freshman. And I thought, wow. well, if I'm good enough to be on the varsity team as a freshman, I could play at the big school. So I transferred as a walk-on at the big school. And the first meeting, the coach basically said, if you don't aren't here on scholarship, you might as well leave. Really? So the next day I started knocking on doors at radio stations. <laughs> <laughs> so in a perfect world, being an MLB player was the top of your list, but radio was not too far of a distant second. Yeah. Well, I got into radio and I had the relationship with the general manager because of baseball. I was a big baseball player in our hometown and he was the guy who did the play by play for our games. I see. And one night after uh, he interviewed me after a game and and I said, well, what do you want to do when you grow up? I said, well, I'm going to play in the major leagues. And he said, well, what if that doesn't work out? And I said, well, I'm going to do play-by-play for the major leagues like you. I'm going to, I'm going to do play-by-play baseball like you do. What a great story. And, and, and so, uh, so I said that to him on the air. You know, it was kind of flippantly. I hadn't really thought about it. And so I thought about it that night. And the next day I thought, I'm going to go see him and see what being on the radio is like. So I went and, went and talked to him and that started the path on radio. So just really kind of a, a spur of the moment. But obviously you had some passion or there was something about radio that moved you. Did you listen to the radio a lot as a kid? I did, yeah, I did. I listened to some great stations. WOW is a big top 40 station in Omaha that was the, the big station for all of us kids. KOMA, Oklahoma City, a uh, clear channel signal that went all over the United States. Uh, big top 40 station. And K-A-A-Y and Little Rock was a, another one that, that their signal went everywhere. WLS in Chicago is a big influence. Massive stations. And then I listened a lot to uh, baseball on the radio. From the Cardinals on KMOX and the uh, Royals on uh, WBAP. Yeah, I'm, I can't remember what the call letters were. WBAP was in Dallas. That was the Rangers. 
actually, and I'll put this all together now with you being such a baseball fan, and I did not know that about your childhood and being, you must have been an excellent baseball player. I was actually reading a book by Harvey Pennick, who was a, uh, a, a great uh, golf coach out of Texas, and he had dreams of being a pro and going out and playing on the tour, and he showed up at a tournament in Texas, and when he was there, he saw Ben Hogan for the first time out of the driving range, and he described that every time that Ben Hogan hit a ball, it was like a shotgun going off, you know, just the It's just that ball. different sound, right? Yeah, and he knew at that moment that as good as he was, it just was, Ben Hogan was that much better, and so he went on to be a, a wildly successful golf coach, but it didn't happen for him in regards to the tour itself. So when you started knocking on those doors in Lincoln, were you now knocking on radio station doors? Yeah, called a few stations and wasn't able to get an interview. And then there was a, a contemporary Christian station, one of the first in the country at the time. This was back in 1978. I walked into the station because they were just around the corner from the apartment I was living in. And I said, I want to see the program director. And uh, the receptionist said, well, his name is Scott Campbell, who if you're into contemporary Christian music, Scott Campbell is legendary. There's an award named after him in the industry because of the, the, what a pioneer he was in that industry. So Scott came out to, to meet me and I said, Scott, I want to be on the air on your station. And if you hire me, I'll be the best personality on your station by next week. <laughs> and so Scott gets this look. He goes, you do realize I'm on the afternoon show, right? <laughs> And uh, so he hired me. No and kidding. He hired me and he told me he became one of my real influences, a big mentor of mine. And he later told me that the only reason he hired me was to teach this cocky little SOB <laughs> coming out of Ord, Nebraska, a lesson. And we ended up becoming great friends. I worked there for two years. He, he ran the station like it was a top 40 station. And he taught me how to do uh, music clocks. He taught me how to do rotations. He taught me discipline on the air. He taught me what a format was all about and, and really showed me what really what solid programming principles were. It sounds like an amazing, an amazing mentor, much like what you were to me. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't think that's a coincidence. I had a lot of people in my life that, that really shaped uh, what, what I became. And, and then Scott ended up, after, after a couple of years working together, Scott left and went over to the big uh, AM full service station in Lincoln, KFOR. And they were looking for someone to run their FM station, which at the time was automated. We were changing, they had the big reel to reel decks and everything. And, and he said, well, I know a guy who's really responsible and he'd be great for this. And so he recommended me. The job happened to have the title program director. Oh my gosh. Which meant I was responsible to keep the station on the air and make sure someone updated the weather forecast and changed the automation tapes when they needed to. And so I became program director. In your early twenties, I'm assuming. I was right? 21. Man. And I became program director at KFRX in Lincoln. Did you at this point have more of an interest in programming on air or you were just into it all? Uh, all of it on air at the time. Uh, I really wanted to be a, a big time personality. And I kind of, you know, you were talking about Harvey Pennock. And when he heard uh, Ben Hogan hit the golf ball, he realized that's not me. Right. right? Um, I had that moment. That really resonated with me. So, so I got to KFRX in Lincoln, and we and about a year after I was there, and everything was going fine. I was making sure all the tapes got changed, and the, the owner of the company was, uh, or the the president of the company was Dick Chapin, who's legendary in the Midwest. You probably heard of him. He's a broker now, and Dick was very intimidating. I mean, he was a no nonsense. He told you exactly what he thought of you all the time. And most people were scared of him. He called me into his office and said, Trace, he's got a big, big person now. Trace, you've done a great job since you've been here, but we're going to change format. We're going to go rock and we're going to go live. And I don't think you got what it takes, but you deserve a chance to try. I just want you to know that you're probably going to fail and I'm going to fire you in about six months. <laughs> um, I said, oh, okay. Um, got to appreciate his honesty, but how did that feel? Were you pretty uh, to show Well, I was intimidated. I mean, what, yeah. what, what do you do? But he brought in a consultant named Frank Felix, who's based in San Diego at the time. And he said, I want you to do everything that this consultant tells you to do. And don't ask any questions. I said, okay, well, I'll do whatever he tells me to do, but I'm going to ask questions. He said, that's fair. <laughs> so Frank became my next mentor. Frank came in and he, he was a, a very tight-listed 
uh, programmer. We took this uh, station from uh, automated top 40 to album rock right up against the other album rock station in the market. And we did it by having a tighter playlist and a more focused product. And I, you know, you talk about doing everything the consultant tells you to do. I did everything the consultant told me to do. And, but I asked a lot of questions and we beat them. We beat him in less than a year. No, so it worked. The consultant came in, great advice. You executed it. And we killed with it. Uh, and we had a, a really great two, th- two and a half year run. So we get to 1984, early 1984, and I had another meeting with Dick Chapin. And Dick uh, brings me into his office and he said, Trace, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you've done great. I didn't think you could do it, but you did it. Here's the thing. Flash Dance is the number one movie in this country, and there's it's Cool in the Gang's uh, celebration is still a big song, and there's nobody in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska that's playing those songs. So we're going to change format. I fired the consultant, and we're going to go top forty a week from Monday. Oh my god! <laughs> so a total left turn. Yeah, and I, we were number one, number one station Jeez. in the market, and he decides that we're going to make more money going top 40 and nobody's playing the most popular songs. I mean, this is before Michael Jackson and Madonna and Prince right. and Wham and that big era of pop music really came on, but he's, it was 83, I guess. So, and, and he said, he said again, I don't think you can do it. You've never programmed it, but you've done everything I've asked you to do. So I'm going to give you a chance to fail and I'm going to, pro- I'm going to fire you in six months. <laughs> so we flipped it to top 40. We, we took, I, I, I changed the entire staff. Uh, flipped it to top 40 and right place at the right time, the station exploded because you couldn't get out of the way of the music cycle. And he was right. Nobody else in town is playing the hits. We're the only station playing the hits and we were awesome. Um, Amazing. So he just had an instinct. He could read the tea leaves. He was one of the most brilliant broadcasters I've ever met. His was determination, force of will, focus, not, not allowing anyone to fail. Uh, failing was failing was really never a choice for him. He was going to succeed no matter who, uh, at what cost there, there was going to be. And so he he said, "We're going to go top forty, and he did it in one of the other markets at the same time. So so so, so the station took off. We did great. Uh, I was doing the morning show, and we kept building. And over about a two year period, um, we we ended up with a twenty one share. Oh my gosh! Uh, in the market. That's incredible. There were several stations in the Midwest that were doing very well. There was um, KRNQ in Des Moines was programmed by Chuck Knight at the time. And WZOK in Rockford was uh, Kipper McGee's station. We were kind of the, uh, the rat pack of baby programmers in small markets, none of us really knowing what we were doing, but we all talked to each other and tried to figure it out. And what an amazing time in regards, especially pop music at that time. It must have just been a, a blast, an absolute blast. Did you have at this point a preference? Because now you've programmed AOR, you've programmed uh, CHR. Is there a format that's resonating or you're still just kind of very wide open to the medium as a whole? Uh, the top 40 was a blast. It was, it was awesome. We had, we, and we had great personalities um, and we had really great personalities around the clock and we did big promotions. That was the thing about Dick Chapin. I mean, he wanted to, he wanted everybody in town to know about us. He wanted people to know that we were here and that we were making a difference in the community. And so we were a, a staff of people. A lot of them, a lot of the people that I hired, a lot of the personalities I hired were students at the University of Nebraska that I was in class with, although I wasn't in class very much because I worked <laughs> yeah. all day and skipped more classes than I went to. <laughs> at that point, were you pretty popular in school, being on air and doing mornings? I, I honestly didn't know that many people. Really? Uh, at the school because I, I, was, I was on the air and uh, I, I did mornings and w- programmed the station all day. And you know what that's like. That's um, a lot. That's and we were small staff. And so I went to class when I could. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, it goes to show you how intelligent you are and resourceful that you were to be able to do that all at uh, the same time and still uh, be able to graduate. That's impressive. So how do you end up going from Lincoln to Kansas? Kansas City is your next move, correct? It was uh, 1980, early 1987. And I had that moment where I realized that I didn't have what it took to be really great on the air. The more experienced I got in programming, And the more I knew, uh, the more I understood what it took to have a really successful station, I knew what I was looking for in personalities. And I knew that I didn't have that it factor. 
I was number one in the morning. Was, uh, uh, another guy, uh, a guy named Dale Johnson. Uh, we were Johnson and Johnson in the morning. We even got a cease and desist from the company. Uh, we <laughs> Did you really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They found out <laughs> that we were using their brand name, Johnson and Johnson. In the morning. <laughs> And then we were number one and everything is very popular and everything was great. But yeah, I, I, I would listen to Scott Shannon at Z100 and I was listening to uh, Rick Dees and some of the really great radio stations. And thought, there's, there's a difference here. Uh, I know what goes on the radio, but I don't have that it factor to deliver it. I think I'd better be a programmer. Interesting. And the only way I could, and the only way I could take myself off the air was to leave Lincoln. I started putting out the feelers, and Dean Hallam was uh, programming KCPW, Power 99, in uh, Kansas City. It was owned by Gannett, the uh, USA Today company at the time. Dean hired me to come to Kansas City and be music director, which was you know, a step backward from being program director and making really good money for Lincoln, Nebraska. I took a pay cut and went to, to learn how to program in a highly competitive top 40 arena. Steve Perrin was programming Q104 against us at the time, and it was a pretty pretty direct head-to-head competition. Took a lot of insight. You're now, I'm guessing, mid-20s, and to make that decision was, I think, wildly mature at that age. It was also crazy. I was 28, and uh, we had just had our first child, Andrew, uh, so <laughs> he was born in, uh, December of 86 and this is, uh, January of 87 when I said, I think I'd better look for a different thing to do with my career. That opportunity came up when we moved in October of 87 to, to Kansas city. As you could have probably stayed and had a, a long successful career in Lincoln doing mornings, but you decided that. Yeah, I could have stayed there for a long time. I was overseeing all the programming for the other stations in the small chain of stations in markets like Springfield, Missouri, and uh, some places like that, Wichita and some places like that. So I was, I was you know, learning to be a consultant uh, at the time and really not knowing what I was doing because I'd earned the trust of Dick Chapin. You know what's interesting, and I just want to take a little bit of a tangent here, but on to coaching. And very rarely are the greatest coaches also the greatest players. And I think you're looked upon as top five consultants uh, in the world when it, uh, you know, radio consultants, and you're incredible and in, in talent coaches at what you do. You look at like a um, Phil Jackson who goes on, uh, had played as a player, but he was never in, uh, an amazing player, but goes on to arguably be the most successful basketball coach of all time. Um, I guess in our business, you could argue that Scott Shannon, it was a great programmer, great on-air talent, but I think he's probably a better on-air talent than he is <laughs> a program director, but that's, that's certainly arguable. What do you think that is? Like, why do you think, what makes the difference? I think it's uh, two different personality types. To be really great on the air, you have to have a charm, a charisma, a passion to be a star, to to really really be the very best that you can possibly be. You got to be kind of a loose spirit. You've got to be willing to put yourself out there and be vulnerable. Great personalities are the ones when they walk into a room at a cocktail party and the room changes. And they can be in a corner telling a story to a small group of people, and it doesn't matter what that story is. They're drawn to that person, and they're entertained by that person, even if they don't care what what that story is all about. You can take the same story and give it to someone who's not a great personality, and it doesn't matter how great that story is, they don't command the room the same way. I call it the it factor. Either you have it or you don't. So well said. Dave Smiley, who you know well and worked with us uh, in San Diego, has the it factor. He changes the room. He's that factor. You can't ignore Dave Smiley. When he walks in the room, the room changes. To that point, I ran into him a few years ago at Morning Show Boot Camp, and we caught caught up for a drink, and he's just such a great storyteller, and you just get captivated. You actually lose track of, of time because you're so consumed with what he's talking about, and that's very interesting. A coach, on the other hand, is someone who is a little bit more you know analytical, thoughtful, and is able to put some things together. It's the difference between being a producer and being an actor. How many actors do you know that are also great producers? Ronnie Howard, Clint Eastwood. There's a handful. 
most of them are either good in front of the camera or behind the camera. And I think a lot of that's the same in radio. It's really hard to do both because it takes such different types of skills. And, I, and, and one of the, the areas that I think gets a lot of um, coaches or program directors into trouble, keeps them from being the best that they can be, is they still have the ego and the desire to be a personality but they don't have the it factor. So now they're coaching personalities and they still wish they were doing it. Really interesting point. So there's probably some resentment there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because a, a coach has to take their satisfaction out of seeing their athletes, their performers be at their best and to excel. That's where you get your greatest satisfaction. That's where, that's where your ego gets fed is seeing it succeed through someone else. So well put. Now, so fascinating. I really appreciate you explaining that, but it makes a tremendous amount of sense. So you've taken the step back in position. You're in a bigger market, but now you're a music director. You've pulled yourself off the air. You've got uh, Andrews one or two at this point, and you've changed cities. Uh, tell me a bit about uh, that experience in, uh, in Kansas City. Well, the transition to Kansas City was great, and Andrew was easy to adjust, so he's, he's one. And uh, so in the, in the summer of 88... Uh, Andrew got a baby brother, Alex. Busy few years for you. So that's August of 88. And in October of 88, I got a job offer to move to Jacksonville, Florida. So right after baby number two is born, we moved again. <laughs> Cindy Johnson has a, a, a heart of gold or, or, or patience of a saint, I guess, is the... Uh, the <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so we moved, we moved to Jacksonville with a, uh, nearly three year old and a, and a, and a brand new, brand new baby. And, uh, I got an offer to go to the big ape W A P E legendary set of call letters. And I've heard so many things about that station. That's the station that has a swimming pool, right? Attached to it. Oh, they probably do now. They didn't at the time. Oh, they didn't at the time. <laughs> okay. Someone had told me there was a swimming pool at the ape. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. So tell me about going to Jacksonville. It was the longest six months of my life and probably the worst. <laughs> uh -oh. You talk about t taking a, the wrong job uh, <laughs> for the right reasons. Uh, legendary radio station, but it was a station that had, was, was in free fall. It had been in the, in the mid-teens, typically. Uh, you know, the Grease Man had, had gone to um, uh, Washington, D.C. at the time. Grease Man's the one that really built WAPE. And following that, there was a lot of, of backlash for the new programming. Station got, uh, got way too aggressive musically. And this is back now, the, the hairband era, correct? So this, this is the hairband era, and they were on the leading edge of hip-hop and rap. And Jacksonville is not um, uh, North Florida. It's really South Georgia. God. <laughs> it, it's a very interesting, uh, eclectic mix of, uh, of people. Uh -huh. And the radio station had fallen to about a five share uh, when I got there. And my job was to come in and stop the bleeding. And I found one of the first things I, I learned is that just like in the stock market, don't catch a falling knife. A stock can always go lower until it hits zero. So can radio stations. <laughs> 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 it's a great piece of advice. So I got, we, we got to Jacksonville just long enough to build a brand new house and moved into it. Oh and my gosh. Uh, that didn't work out. So I was out the door uh, shortly after that. Just six months, six, uh, six, eight months. Yeah. Oh man. And then did you land on your feet quickly in San Diego or was this that same day? Uh, and it's a, it's a long involved story that we'll go out for a drink sometime. And I'll tell you the whole story of that uh, six months in Jacksonville. It's very interesting. And I won't say it in a polite, uh, talk about it in a polite <laughs> podcast, but um, so a lot of things happened behind the scenes. And the afternoon that I was, I was fired, I got fired on a, a Thursday morning. And that afternoon I got home and my phone rang and it was Scott Shannon. No kidding. I'd never talked to him before in my life. I didn't think he knew me from Adam. That there's no reason he would know me. And how did he get my number? Wow. But my phone rang and Scott Shannon called and he said, Tracy Johnson, I've been following you since you were a baby DJ in Lincoln, Nebraska. That's incredible. And what just happened to you today is the best thing that could possibly happen to you. Uh, this is going to launch your career you didn't want to be there anyway. If there's anything I can do for you, you let me know. He gave me his number, and we, 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 and that was my introduction to Scott Shannon. Just you telling that story and thinking of Scott Shannon leaving that message gives me goosebumps. That's 
amazing. I mean, that must have just felt you having one of the worst days of your life and just must have taken you from, uh, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. So that, so that was amazing. And then, you know, everything kind of happens for a reason. I've always found myself in a position of good fortune. Um, the next day I got a call from Alan Burns. And Alan said, I've been seeing what's happening in your career. I've heard a lot of really great things about you. I'm thinking of expanding my company, and I think you'd make a great consultant. The same day, I got a call from Dwight Douglas, who was running Burkhart Douglas and Associates, which is one of the big consulting firms of the time. Um, And he said exactly the same thing. I'm looking to expand, and I think you'd make a great consultant. Would you come to Atlanta and talk to us? It's amazing. All these opportunities just uh, opening all these different doors for you. Yeah. So I'm thinking, okay, there's two people who are really big time consultants who think I would make a good consultant. There must be something to that. I should probably look into this. Right. So I first went to Atlanta because I'm an Atlanta Braves fan. And I thought, okay, if I'm going to be a consultant, I'm going to do it Atlanta because I'll I'll make him give me season tickets. Um, (laughs) I like the way you're thinking of your negotiation. (laughs) Very smart. (laughs) So 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 they flew me into town. I had dinner with them. I spent the next morning with them. And they bought me tickets to a Braves game. And the Braves were horrible in 1988. I mean, horrible. There was nobody at the game. Saturday afternoon. So I'm going, I'm going to the Braves game and then flying out Saturday afternoon uh, after the game. And it was a deluge. The game got rained out in the bottom of the first inning. Oh, um, and uh, from there, the, a few days later, I went to Washington, D.C. and met with Alan. And Alan and I really hit it off. And he became my ne- he became the next big influence in my radio career. And you work for him as a consultant. Do you move to D.C.? Yeah, we moved to D.C. Uh, 1989, and you know, took two kids, packed up uh, packed up a truck, and moved from Jacksonville to Washington D.C. And Alan and Donna Burns were just fantastic. They were great to me. Alan taught me as much about uh, consulting and, and strategic programming as. Uh, Scott Campbell had taught me about formatics and as much as the consultant and Lincoln Frank Felix had taught me about, uh, being competitive. Um, Alan, uh, Alan was consulting Z100. He was consult, uh, uh, Shannon was gone by then. It was Steve Kingston was, was, uh, programming Z100. Right. Cause Shannon was out here at pirate probably at that time. Yeah. Alan consulted, uh, B96 in Chicago, working with Dave Shakes. He was consulting WMMS in Cleveland, legendary station. He was working with a couple of stations in LA. I can't remember who they were exactly. I, never, I didn't work them there. But Alan gave me my own stations. He, he got small markets for me. And that's how he was expanding the company. And he was advising me on how to work with clients. And then he took me on his trips with him to the big stations so I could watch him do it and help him. Oh, my gosh. What an amazing experience. And it was, and so I met, I met, I met Dave Shakes that way. I met uh, Steve Kingston that way. And a few years later, Steve Kingston offered me the music director job at Z100, which I turned down because I loved working for Alan so much. So this just now opened all the doors to some of the biggest stations and programmers around the country. Did Alan specialize in any specific formats or was it? Alan, Alan was uh, his best at hot AC and his second best format is probably CHR, uh, female-based formats. He, he's, he's, he's specialized in female-based formats, but he would consult other formats too. That, that's where he was at, at his best. What was your favorite part about that gig? I know it was on, you're on the road a tremendous amount. Was it, uh, I've heard both great things about consulting, but it also can be incredibly frustrating as well. And so what did you like and what did you hate? The hardest transition was to go from being responsible for the sound that's coming out of the speakers of the radio station to being powerless of what comes out of the speaker. <laughs> and, and when the program director gets it right and it sounds great, they get all the credit <laughs> because, and, and rightfully so they should, but that was a big transition in going from being a programmer where you could take pride in, in, in your art and the art that you create on the air, even though it comes out of other people's mouths, it's the art that you're creating and you take a lot of pride in that. As a consultant, your job is to make that program director a hero to make that program director look good. And the program director in exchange makes you a hero because you got a whole stable of stations that are number one. So, and I had great programmers. Uh, well, that's one of the things that I really learned is how to identify great talent and hire the right people and put them in place. I had in Rockford at WZOK, the program director was Greg Strassel and his music director was John Ivy. Oh my gosh, what a combo. Uh, right. And I'm their consultant. <laughs> 
<laughs> we had a blast. They didn't know anything about research. And I only knew a little bit. I only knew what Alan had taught me, but I'm coming into town and I'm doing the, I'm doing, we're doing the auditorium test together. And I'm going out, I'm, in, I'm hosting the auditorium test and they're doing it with the uh, pencil and paper. And we take all of it back and we go to, to Greg's apartment and we're breaking down the results in his apartment all night long. <laughs> I get it on the air the next morning. Okay? No computers. We just had a blast. What? That sounds fantastic. I would have loved to have been there. Do you have any pictures from that? Uh, I probably do. I'll send you some. Yeah, please. Yeah. I'd love to put those and, up in the show And notes. then in... Um, in Huntington, West Virginia, at WKEE, I hired Pat Paxton. Oh my gosh! And Pat was my program director. He was in La Crosse, uh, Wisconsin, and Pat came out to be the the, the PD in Huntington. Unreal! Uh, his first big programming job. That was that was Pat's first big break. In Omaha, we put in Ken Benson. Unbelievable! Ken was my program director in Omaha, and uh, and we and we worked together there. That's and, just you know, it's like that in, in every market. When, when you hire, look, when you, when you can identify the right talent and you've got a good fit and you've got support, good things are going to happen. And that, and that's what I, that's what I really learned in that. And I got that from Alan. He said, he said, make sure that the, the other thing Alan taught me, the, the, the most important, the, the, the most important thing Alan taught me, Alan taught me three things. He taught me that the most important thing you can do with a client is to make sure that, uh, that, 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 whatever problem they're trying to solve, they don't choose a route that will cause them to fail. And there's probably a couple of bad decisions where they will fail. Don't let them do that. There's probably a couple of, of choices where no matter how badly they execute, they will succeed. Try to get them to do that. And there's a whole bunch of solutions that are in between those two extremes. But by the time you leave the market, make sure everybody's on the same page, because if they pick one of those choices in between, you can make it work. But I love that. It's like the Sun Tzu of radio consulting. What great counsel. Yeah. And that's such a simple philosophy. Try to find the perfect answer. But if you can't find it, just make sure that everybody's on the same page with one that won't fail and you can make it work. So that was one thing. The other was hiring good people. Make sure you hire good people. And he modeled it. I mean, he's working with Steve Kingston and, and Dave Shakes and uh, the, the legendary WMMS. And, and, and he always looked to put the best people in those situations. Oh, uh, Pete Casenza. Uh, with, with some, he was uh, my program director in Allentown, Pennsylvania at WAEB. Man, what a who's who of radio legends. It was Pete's first programming job. So he was a music director before he was in, uh, he was in New Haven and uh, we, we brought him from New Haven into, uh, into Allentown as the program director. So again, great people make you look good. Um, and then, the, and then the, the, the third thing that Alan taught me is that I'm creative. I never considered myself to be creative and Alan would, I, I once asked him, you know, he always would call me into his office to be on calls with certain stations from time to time. And he'd ask me questions while we're on these conference calls and he'd throw things to me while we're in meetings in, in big stations and, and ask for my opinion. And I, I said, why do you do that? I said, I said, you, you really put me on the spot. He, he goes, because you're creative and I'm not. And I said, Alan, that doesn't make any sense to me. I said, I'm, I'm the least creative person. I don't have a creative thought in, in, I don't have a creative bone in my body. I'm not, I'm just not creative. And he goes, no, there's two kinds of creativity. One is where you sit down with a blank piece of paper and you come up with a whole bunch of ideas. That's original creativity. But the better creativity is when you see someone who has a couple of ideas and you can tell them 10 things to do with it. He goes, that's you. Wow. And I never thought about it that way. I never considered that I was a creative person until he told me that. And he, he, say, he said, I don't have either of those things. He said, that's why I need you. He, say, he said, I'm a, I'm a research guy. I'm a format guy. I'm a clocks guy. I'm a, I'm a focus. He goes, he goes, you bring this creative energy to what I do that I don't have. That's why we, and he said, that's why we work together so well. That is so fascinating. And it makes a tremendous, a tremendous amount of sense. And it actually just for a quick second, a little bit of background on us in that I learned so much from you at the beginning of my career. And I've always looked at you as being just this creative genius, uh, especially from a branding and promotional standpoint. And I've really tried to mimic so many things that I've learned from you. The other probably biggest influence from a programming 
uh, perspective in my life has been Johnny K. And Johnny, I think, is much more like the way you describe Alan to be, much more research, much more clocks. And so the two of us worked really well together because I was that creative. We were the yin to each other's yang, which is very fascinating. And you need both. Yes, you absolutely do. Got to have both. You do. How long did you end up working with Alan? Three years. Uh, just over three years. Uh, by that time, Andrew, my older son, was about to start into kindergarten. Uh, I, was on, I was traveling a lot. And my wife uh, sa- sat me down and said, hey, listen, uh, if you want to keep consulting, that's fine. But uh, we've got a, a, a kid, you're starting to miss birthdays. And I know you want to coach his baseball teams. And we're not going to move after he starts school. He's going to go to the same school. I said, oh, well, we'd better be on the lookout for something. (laughs) By this point, though, Cindy has moved with you from Nebraska to Kansas City to Jacksonville to D.C. So you've had four moves, and this will become now your fifth in, what, the scope of about five or six years, right? Yeah. So this is 1992. Earlier, I had had a call from one of my clients. I I worked with uh, Midwest uh, Television at their stations in Champaign, Illinois, and Peoria, and their third station was in San Diego. It was B100 in San Diego. And earlier I'd had a call from their uh, general manager, Paul Palmer. And Paul said, hey, I just hired this new morning show called Jeff and Jer, and we need a new program director because the person I've got here isn't able to do it. And my, you know, the stations that you're working with in Champaign and Peoria say good things about you. Would you like to interview for the job? And I said, yes, I very much would. And we had a... Great conversations, and Paul ended up saying, look, I don't think you have what it takes. I don't think you're ready to coach. I don't think you're ready to manage this show. It's a really big show, and I don't think you have what it takes to do it. And by the way- So he turned me down. But that sounds very familiar, because that's the same thing that was said to you when you were- Right, same thing. (laughs) In Lincoln. (laughs) So I stayed with Alan for a while. I was a little bit disappointed, and uh, a a few months later, I get a call from Q106 in San Diego. And San Diego is a place that my wife and I had- gone on vacation there in about 84 and it's a place that we always said that it's a place we'd like to live someday never thought it might happen and q106 called and said listen we need a program director it was owned by gary edens at the time edens broadcasting that also owned q105 in tampa and this was in the era where the power pig was really having its way with q105 and q106 in san diego was getting attacked pretty well by Z90. And not just attacked pretty well, but beaten pretty soundly by Z90. And so he said, I need someone to come in and fix this station. It was a a shot at San Diego. I got along great with the general managers, Bob Bollinger. Bob and I got along very well, and he he offered me the job. And I I came to San Diego in 1992, uh, July of 92. And this now is just an amazing story because you're literally, Q is in horrendous shape, getting beat badly by Z, and this is your first worst to first story. So how do you put all this together? Well, it was it was worse than I knew. I knew it was down. I knew it was going to be a big turnaround and it was going to take some time, but I didn't know that the uh, station had gone into receivership and was owned by the banks. Oh my gosh. The banks had taken over the company and I didn't know that. So I, I, I got to the market and I, I finally, they get, Bob gave me a copy of the research and uh, I saw the, re, the perceptual that had just come out and we, were, we had no shot. We were done. And so I, I did an analysis and I went back to Bob and they said, look, I think we've got three choices here. One is we can blow it up and go country. But then I'm out of a job because I don't know anything about programming country. (laughs) Uh, Number two is we can market our way out of this and go in between you. B100 was the big AC station, AC slash hot AC. And Z90 was very, very hot uh, uh, rap. We called it rap at the time. We'd call it hip hop now. But they, they were they were they were very they were thumping. And Q106 had kind of followed them down that rap hole and had the image for being rap at the time. But I thought, I said, you know, we can market our way out of this and move over and be the hot AC station in position between these two, but it's going to take some time and it's going to be expensive. And he goes, what's the third option? I said, well, we can go hire Jeff and Jer. <laughs> because they're the number one show. Look at the research. They're, they're terrific, but they haven't reached their potential yet. 
So uh, Bob and I went to Gary Eden's with those three options. And Gary said, well, we're not going to change format because the banks won't let us. They're just trying to sell it. So we're not going to change format. I said, okay, so now we have two options. Can we go hire Jeff and Jer or can we have some money to market it? He goes, you're not getting any money to market it because the banks aren't spending anything. And he said, forget about hiring Jeff and Jer. And I don't even know what, they, what, what it's going to cost because we're not adding to our expenses. We've got a lot of personalities that are under long-term contracts. So we can't get out of that and move money around. So go fix it, but you can't do any of the three things that would fix it. So your hands are just tied. And we had Jojo Kincaid was doing afternoons and Anita Rush was in middays. And we had a, we had a expensive and very talented staff, but a station that was really in shambles. It was a mess. And so Bob and I left uh, Phoenix in a meeting with Gary and got back to San Diego. And I said, so Bob, what are we going to do? He goes, well, Bob's the best. Bob goes, the way I look at it is if we don't turn this around. We're probably both going to get fired. And if we're going to get fired, we might as well get fired for doing the right thing. Let's go hire Jeff and Jerry anyway. <laughs> Wouldn't you love to have a general manager like that? Uh, I don't care what the owner just told us. We're going to go write checks that we're not authorized to write. And we're going to go do the right thing for his company. Oh my God. I love that. So I called Jeff and Jaren, set up a meeting. Uh, they had no idea who I was, but we set up a meeting and I, I told them who I was. And I said, I want to talk to you about your contract. And so we set up a meeting in a hotel circle in San Diego in a private room. So nobody would see us having lunch together. Jeff and Jared got, this is, this is hilarious. Jeff and Jared got to the meeting early and uh, left a note on the table in the room. And then they left. <laughs> what did the note say? I got there right, at, right on time. And I walked in and there's a note on there saying, if this is the way you're going to treat your talent, we want nothing to do with it. Love Jeff and Jerry. And that was all that was in there. And I got there right on time. And I'm going, where is it? <laughs> walked in about a minute. They, they left me there for about a minute and walked in a minute later, just cracking up. <laughs> and, and, and that's, yeah, we had a great meeting. Uh, uh, and, and if you ask Jerry today, uh, what the best question, uh, the best thing a program director has ever said to him, he'll probably tell you this. Cause he said this once at an NAB panel, he said, uh, when we first met with Tracy, he sat down and he said, I can't tell you how to do a better show than you're doing because you're doing it better than I ever could. I just want to know how I can help you be more popular. <laughs> and he great, said, nobody man. has ever asked us that question before. And he said, from that first question, I knew that we wanted to work for this guy. And so we had a we spent the whole afternoon together talking about radio. I told them that they had the potential to be legendary personalities on a great radio station but they weren't going to be truly mass appeal on the station that they were on. I gave them all the reasons why. I told them some of the information we found out in our research, which they didn't, really, they didn't know at the time how good they were. They didn't know how popular they were. They didn't know how good they were. And I laid out the plan of what I wanted to do with the station. I said, guys, I shouldn't tell you this because it's competitive stuff. You could take it to B100 and whatever we're planning to do, it's, it's gonna, we'll, we'll fail because it's so easy for them to cover it if you're there but I've got no choices here. And so they were intrigued enough with the whole idea that they wanted to meet Bob and Jerry and Bob hit just were like brothers and Jeff and I were really close. And the four of us were close. So our, we were all going out the, the eight of us with our wives. And, uh, and so we had this courtship that lasted several months until their contract was coming up. And at the end we said, we got to figure out a way to work together. What's it going to take came up with a number and we signed them to a contract with Gary Edens, not knowing we were even talking to them. Oh my God, that is unreal. What did Gary do when he found out? He was not happy, uh, <laughs> but, but there was not much he could do. He said, this better work. Everything fell into our laps. Uh, Jeff and Jer were like the media darlings. Every television station loved them. They'd already been on the cover of San Diego Magazine and Paul Palmer was still the, uh, the general manager at B100. He was trying to sign them to a new contract. He was coming and waiting outside the studio door every day to try and get them into another negotiating meeting. And they would start leaving their show 10 minutes early so they didn't have to see him. Wow. And coming up with one excuse after another why they didn't want to meet him. And it frustrated Paul so much. And then, and then Jeff and Jer started to leak little hints in the media that, well, you know, we're not sure what's going on. We haven't been offered a contract yet. 
Well, they hadn't been offered a contract because they wouldn't go to a meeting to be offered one. (laughs) (laughs) But it worked out so well. So Paul got frustrated and uh, sent them, I forget exactly what the sequence was, but he sent them a message and said, unless you come to a negotiating session so we can work this out and keep you here, I'm taking you off the air a week from Monday. Wow. So now they've got a memo from the general manager threatening to take them off the air. Jeez. So we're talking with Jeff and Jerry and they're saying, what should we do? I said, let him pull you off the air because now he's the bad guy and you're the victims. Sure. And we'll come in as the white knight saying, Jeff and Jerry need a place to be on the radio. You couldn't write a better story. That date came and went. Paul took them off the air. And then Paul recorded, I still got it somewhere. Paul recorded a, a promo that aired on the station every hour. is about a 90 second promo saying that we know you're wondering what happened to Jeff and Jer. I'm really frustrated. We've been trying to negotiate with them. They don't come to meetings. We've offered them hundreds of thousands of dollars. We've offered them sports cars. We've offered them everything under the sun and they won't take our offer. So we had no other choice but to do this, to get them into a meeting, what Paul was saying was basically true. Unbelievable. And but the offer had never really been made. So this just blew up. Uh, the, the phone calls to B100, they lit up the switchboard. It was, uh, and, and it wasn't Jeff and Jer's fault. It was, why aren't you letting Jeff and Jer talk on the radio? <laughs> it was B100's fault. So the TV stations pick up on it. And Jeff and Jer ended up on four TV stations over two days. Them saying, what's going on? Why are you off the air? And they said, we don't know. All of a sudden, Paul told us that we can't go on the radio anymore. And we weren't even <laughs> given a chance to go on the air and explain. We, we, don't, we don't know. Well, they're, they're saying on the radio station that you've been offered all this money and these sports cars. And Jerry said, if we were offered that kind of money and sports cars, you think we would be sitting here right now? Oh, we would have signed that deal. <laughs> And they said, no, there's, there hasn't been an offer. There hasn't been a contract put in front of us. We, we have no idea what he's talking about. And so all the sympathy came on Jeff and Jer. At the same time, we put up a billboard campaign with, you know, uh, coming soon to mornings on Q106. And we had an outline. We'd already done the photo sessions and we had the outline of Jeff and Jer. Unreal. So um, it, it, it escalated, it elevated, and then you know, they, they stayed uh, high profile on TV and uh, they went on TV one night and said, well, we, we have an announcement to make. And the announcement was that since it didn't look like they were going to get the opportunity to go back on B100, uh, our friends, we, we met some new friends uh, over at Q106. And they've given us an opportunity to be back on with our radio family and, we're, and gave the day that they were going on. And then shortly after that, we unveiled the marketing campaign. The billboards went up. Billboards, which we didn't have permission to spend money on either. (laughs) How much of this story played out because it was strategically masterminded by you and Bob? How much of it was just the cards came down in your favor in just the way that B100 had played it out? Yeah, well, you know what? All of that. All of that is true, uh, but but you know, I look. I th- just like at the beginning of this conversation where you talked about the influence that I had on your career, and I'm I'm really proud of that. But I'm more proud that you took advantage of your opportunities and capitalized on it. So, and I think opportunities come to people all the time. It's what you do with the opportunities when they come up, and that's kind of what was happening. We didn't know what was going to happen from one day to the next. But we thought, okay, here's our current situation. Let's figure out what to do with this. And, it, and, and everything worked out. So, so we changed the positioning state. I, I got a great Jeff and Jerry story for you with this. We changed the positioning statement on the station to it's the mornings. Is it the, is it the mornings or is it the music? And then I went to Jeff and Jerry and said, one thing I haven't told you, when you come over to Q106, they were playing eight songs an hour on B100. I said, when you come to Q106, you're now a talk show. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm going to let you play any music. And Jerry goes, we're not good enough. We can't do that. I said, yes, you are. You just don't know it yet. And we're going to figure it out. And, and they said, well, why can't, we, why can't we play music? It's like the weirdest conversation between a program <laughs> yeah. director and a That's the polar opposite. <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I said, because we are a station that's perceived as being hip hop. You're coming from a station that's perceived as being wimpy. You're, they're still playing like air supply songs. Right. So your audience is going to be scared by our music. Our music fans think you're wimpy. 
So you can't play music, but you're going to be the champion of the music. So I'm going to move the music so it's compatible with the audience the B100's coming from. We're going to move into that hot AC position, and you're going to be the face of it, but you can't play any of it. But I'm going to put you all over the promos talking about it. That was brilliant in of itself to be able to think about that. I didn't realize that formatically the two stations were so far different at the time. Yeah, they, well, yeah, they, they, they were very different. And, and so, so Jeff and Jer's endorsement made this station called Q106 safe for their audience. As long as we didn't get too edgy. So it gave us permission to move all the way over into the mainstream center. And we essentially became both the top 40 and the hot AC station in the market just because Jeff and Jer put us in a position to, uh, to, to be able to change the image literally overnight. We changed the music uh, the weekend before they came on the air. They came on the air and endorsed it. And we became, is it the mornings? Is it the music? And then we, we got artists to say, it's definitely, hey, this is uh, Billy Joel. And it's definitely the mornings. It can't be the music. It's definitely the And we had Jeff and Jaron say, is it the mornings or the music? Isn't it obvious? It's the music. <laughs> and we had listeners. And we, we had a promotion called I Switch to the New Sound of Q106. Uh, we called it the Switch Campaign. Um, I never forget, we had a, we had a great promo. Uh, we set up a listen line and a, a listener called and said, uh, will the last person listening to B100 please turn out the lights? <laughs> some- and we ran that to death. Uh, B100, uh, we did a perceptual six months later and B100 was, was best known in the market. This is the station that was number one. They were best known in the market six months later as the station that fired Jeff and Jer. Amazing. And all they tried to do was hire them to a long, long-term contract. <laughs> you are an absolute marketing uh, genius. You, you're like a Seth Godin. So we rode that wave. We went from 19th to first in six months. B100 went from first to 22nd in that same period of time. They dropped to a 0. 0.9 Unbelievable. share. Unbelievable. So now how does the whole thing flip? And this is where the story and you and I finally meet gets even crazier because you and Bob and Jeff and Jer having all the success at Q106. And now you guys cross the street to go back to B1 or to go to B100 and Jeff and Jer are still back at Q106. So please, I'd love to hear about that. Well, up to that point, this was the best time in my life, the best time in my career. Uh, we were number one. Jeff and Jer were in the mornings. Anita Rush did middays. Jojo Kincaid afternoons. And we brought in Dave Smiley to do nights. What a lineup. Tom Jurgen was the music director. Jeez. So, I mean, this station was rocking. You're living in your dream town. Making a, the station was making a fortune. Gary Edens was able to sell the station because we were so successful, ignoring his, his, uh, his work. edict to not hire them, which is amazing. Did he ever say to you finally, like, you guys were right and thank you? Or was he kind of bitter to oh, the he end? Us. Yeah, he, 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 oh, he did. <laughs> thanked us when he was introducing the new owners. <laughs> <laughs> so the new owners came in. It was uh, some local money and a, and a local operator that uh, bought it to flip it. Because they saw how well the station was doing and knew it was still in receivership by the banks. The banks still just wanted out from under it. And it hadn't operated at this, this high margin for a long enough period of time to be reflected in the year-over-year cash flow. Oh. So, so they saw this opportunity to come in and flip it. So they came in and bought it. I don't know what they paid for it, but they, they, they didn't pay much for it. And... Uh, the, the new owner came in and the, they owned a rock station in town. They owned Rock 102 uh, at the uh-huh. time. They came into the first meeting and the whole staff meeting. Uh, and we had a big staff. We had a big promotion. Jeff Fetterman was the promotion and marketing director. Oh, my gosh. That's unbelievable. Bob was a great hirer. He hired Fetterman. And, so, and, and Jeff and I became good friends. And he was the marketing director. And the assistant promotions director was Liz Pecora. <laughs> It's just like a who's who. Who was doing the imaging? Do you remember who was doing the imaging? Uh, Tom Watts. Tom Watts, man. Tom Watts that, did imaging. He was doing, he's at Sirius now. He's at Sirius XM. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, but we had a really big staff. We had a person, their only job was writing copy for commercials. We had a production director in charge of commercial production and another production director in charge of imaging. But neither of them did voice work. Man. It was a heavy staff, it was, but, but, but it was a great staff. And, and, and we were having the time of our lives. And, and the new owner came in and the first meeting said, um, 
wow, there sure are a lot of you working here. Uh, yeah, not first, good. First words to his new own, new company. I went, uh-oh, this isn't going to end well. Uh, Al Peterson, uh, the now deceased Al Peterson, was his uh, VP of programming. He introduced me to Al and said, you'll be working closely with Al, and he has some ideas on what you should do with the station. And I'm going, he has some ideas with what I should do with the station. Are you kidding me? Look, uh, uh, Number one by a mile. Stay out of its way. Right. We were number one every day part, every demographic, 12 to 64. Jeez. So Al and I met several times and Al said, you're not playing enough rock. Al, come, Al, Al had come from rock. He came from rock and talk. And I, I said, Al, that's, that's wrong. We're, we're a pop music station that leans, if anything, a little bit rhythmic. And, and, and we need this rhythm in the, in, in, the, in the texture. And he goes, you're not playing Aerosmith and Brian Adams. You need to play those songs. Oh, man. Okay. So, you know, I, I, we didn't. I wouldn't. A few weeks later, Bob Bollinger uh, comes to my office and said, come on, we're going to lunch. And we went to lunch at the Thai house. You know where that is, right? In Convoy School. We used to go there all the time when we were at Star. And Bob takes me in and he says, so how are things going with Al? And I said, well, I think they're going pretty well. I'm starting, you know, I get along with the guy. I don't agree with what he wants me to do with the station, but I think we've hit on a, a pretty good place. In fact, we have a meeting this afternoon to go over some things. He goes, you don't have a meeting to go over things. He have, we have a meeting because he's going to fire you. Oh my God. I just didn't want, didn't want you to hear it from him. Holy moly. And I was like, that's the last thing on my mind. I had no idea. Right. So they handled it well. They said, look, you've got a couple of choices. Well, either you, you've got a contract that lasts another nine months. We'll pay you through the end of the contract, but then you can't work in the market or we'll let you out of the contract and we have no obligation to you and you can go work somewhere else. And so you chose option B. And called B100. <laughs> <laughs> so going all the way back to the story I told you before, when Paul Palmer called me and said, I've got this opening and I don't think you can manage Jeff and Jer. Right. So I called Paul and said, hey, what do you think? You think I can, uh, you, you want to talk about me coming to work for you? And Paul was awesome. Paul was just terrific. So now how long does it take for you to orchestrate Getting because when I joined you, Bob Bullinger was there. Yeah, Jeff and Jer had just signed to get over there. So, yeah. explain how do you lay the groundwork to make all that happen? And, and Tom Watts and Anita Rush and Anita Rush, sure. And yeah, Dave Smiley and Smiley and yeah, uh, we, we we brought just and most of the sales staff uh, came over. Gina Landau was uh, was uh, was a sales. She was at Q one hundred six as well. Manager. We brought her over. So it was uh, February of ninety four. And we did a research project and we found how bad the images of the station were, but it was also a format search to figure out what B100 should become. And the hole in the market was exactly what B100 was programming. Okay. Mainstream slash hot AC, because Q106 was still perceived as being more top 40 than it really was. And as soon as I was out the door, Al started adding all those rock songs. He put on Def Leppard songs. He put on oh, Aerosmith. Wow. So it, it, was, it was a train wreck. Uh, sure. The sound of the station was just a, a train wreck. So he made the station musically vulnerable, but not perceptually vulnerable because you've still got Jeff and Jer. Right. And you've still right. got these personalities. You've got the big footprint in the market and you've got all this momentum going. So we found that when we did the research, we found out we want to be exactly what we are but we can't do it with a station called B100 because they think we fired Jeff and Jer. So how do we get from being B100 to being called something else, but sounding almost the same? So I, I came up with an idea of San Diego's great radio experiment. Okay. And I, and, and Paul signed on with this and I went on the air with promos uh, every hour and said, Hey, this is Tracy Johnson. I'm the new program director. And we apologize for all the things that B100 has done over the past. <laughs> we made a lot of mistakes and it, it's a mess. <laughs> it's a mess because you turned it into a mess from across the street. <laughs> and we have no idea how to fix it. We need your help. So I, I said, effective today, we're starting San Diego's great radio experiment. We want you to tell us what this station should be. And it can be anything. It can be, it can be country. It can be marching music. It can be all Disney. 
anything goes, we need your opinion. We opened up a phone line. We were doing faxes back then. So right. you access your suggestions. I, I had a, uh, I, I took calls for an hour every day. Uh, after a while, I started taking calls live on the air with people making <laughs> suggestions. And <laughs> so we were just basically just trying to create noise, get people, what are they doing? Right. So the series of promos kept continuing, uh, we continued and it got a little bit more specific. So a few weeks went by and I finally went on the air and said, look, we've taken all of your input and there's some really great ideas. So starting next week, we're going to start experimenting with different ideas. And so listen, every day, we're going to change format every day, starting Monday. And one day we were all Elvis. <laughs> and one day we were country, a legitimate country. One day it was show tunes, which was very popular, <laughs> by the way. It really made us think. Um, another day it was children's music. We did all Disney and children's music. Another day it was B100. It was, uh, we didn't call it B100 though. We called it uh, something different. Uh, I think right. we were using the call letters at the time. And it sounded just like B100 would sound. One day it was top 40. When, and so like for, for seven days, we changed format every day. And then the next Monday we went back to normal. And I said, okay, we're looking at all the results. Uh, you know, we're still taking your votes. You can still vote on it. Uh, is it going to be this, this, or this? And then we narrowed that week. We narrowed it down we got it down to three. And one of them was hot AC, of course. And so we, so we, we put an ad in the paper so you could uh, you fill out this ballot and send it back of what we should be. Right. And we had the, the listen line, the, 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 the recorded lines were on. We took phone calls all the time. And of course, you know, a couple of weeks, we got it down to the following week. So we went two weeks of taking the voting. And we got it down to the final three. And then we changed format every hour for a weekend to one of the three things. So good. And we're tabulating the final votes coming up. We'll announce the final vote Monday morning. And on Monday morning, we announced the final vote and we changed format to star 100.7. This is what you told us you wanted. This is what San, the, we called it the radio station San Diego build. And by this time, you've brought over Smiley, Anita, Tom, I'm assuming, came over with you at that time. Yeah, Tom was the first one. Uh, Tom's contract came up at about the same time mine would have. So by this time, six months into it, his contract came up. So I hired Tom. Uh, when Anita's contract came up, we hired Anita. I forget the sequence and, and what order it was. A lot of the salespeople weren't under contract, so we got them right away. When did Bob make the move? Uh, Bob, uh, about two years later, the ownership uh, let Paul go. There were some other things that were going on with the AM station that uh, Paul ended up having to fall on the sword for that. I see. So they terminated Paul and they were looking for a general manager. So I got them talking to Bob. And they brought Bob over to be general manager then. That was like 96, maybe 95, 96, late 95, early 96. And then how long did it take you to now knock Q106 off its pedestal? It took one year from the time that we became San Diego's new star to the, from the time we switched that one year later, we had beaten them 12 plus, but not the morning show. We beat them 12 plus, but we couldn't come close in mornings. So they still had the Jeff and Jer position. Yeah. So Smiley's, Smiley's deal came up. We brought Smiley over to do afternoons. Right. Anita was doing midday. Smiley was doing afternoons. I made a, a big mistake in the morning. I hired the, the, the country's first all-female morning show, Sean and Donna. Which was way ahead of its time. It, well, and you know, it was a great idea. And they were both yeah. individually really terrific personalities. Donna came from Champaign, Illinois. Who I, I met her when I was consulting that station. And Sean was part of, of um, Dave Robbins' morning show at WNCI in Columbus. And she's really witty and funny. The mistake that I made and the lesson that I learned is I hired two responders and I had nobody who knew how to drive the bus. Oh. I had, I had no, either one of them had hosting skills. Interesting. So the show failed, but not because it was two women. The show failed because I cast them wrong. That's fascinating, but that makes a tremendous amount of sense. I got it. I really commend you for taking though that chance because back at that point, I don't think anyone had thought about doing something like the, you know, like that. And it's sad that it took all the way until the nineties for that to happen, but you were, it, it was definitely big news within the industry. Well, it just made sense. We're a female targeted radio station talking to women. Let's get some good, strong women that people like, and let's put them on and let's, uh, what, what better way to talk about them than talking about it with your girlfriends. Right. Right. Um, right. But, but I was, uh, I was too caught up in the novelty of it 
rather than the 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 details of casting it right. Yeah. And and so you know that the, the, so the show didn't work. It didn't succeed. You could tell pretty quickly that it wasn't coming together and it wasn't coming it wasn't their fault. It was my fault. So uh, Smiley was doing afternoons and was doing great. Greg Sims uh, was part of that station. He was uh, uh, he, uh, he he was a holdover from B100. Um Greg's doing afternoons at K Earth now and yeah. all the mornings here in San Diego on uh, on the station here. You made Joe Cipriano the voice of the station. Joe is the voice. Uh, From the beginning, Joe Cipriano was the voice of the station. And so we moved Smiley to Mornings, uh, hired Matt McWhirter, who ended up going to do Mornings in Phoenix. And I think he's in the Northwest now. I'm not sure exactly where he is, but, and and Kim Morrison, who'd been in the market for a long time. So it was Smiley, Kim and Matt in the morning. And um, then we were looking for an afternoon show and I met Mark Jagger at the San Diego Air Show, where he was doing a remote broadcast for the oldies station. Wow. Mark was, uh, and he was all by himself in the tent. He, he had no promotion people. He's, he's got this tent set up, and there's nobody there because everybody's over at the show, and he's doing this live broadcast. <laughs> I'm looking over at him, and, and he's, I, I went over and I said, I, I, so I just went over and introduced myself, and I had Andrew with me. Andrew was running around with me, and Mark was so nice to Andrew. And the way that he made him feel, and he was that type, that that person who kind of just changed the conversation because he's so accommodating. And I said, "Have you ever thought about going to a different station?" Yeah, well, I'm dying over here on KCBQ, <laughs> all by myself, alone in this tent at, uh, <laughs> at an air show. I ended up hiring Mark to do afternoons, and he said, "He said I'll only do it if you'll hire my girlfriend to be my my, my co-host, Christy." Amazing. And Christy was a personality in town. And I said, look, I'm not looking for a co-host. I don't have the budget for two personalities. He goes, well, make her the traffic person then. Just pay her what you pay a traffic person. <laughs> so we hired Jagger and Christy to do afternoons, who are now currently top three in San Diego doing mornings on magic. And I consult them. <laughs> and doing just incredibly well. I mean, they've been on the air now in San Diego nonstop since that day, since yeah. you hired them. Yeah. It's uh, the, amazing. The other, the other uh, hire that we made uh, there in that about 95 or 96 was Michael Steele, who was the uh, music director at a station I consulted in Rapid City. He was another one that uh, Bob Lewis was the program director there. Yeah. Uh, Bob was a program director. Michael was the music director and did nights. And we hired Michael to come out and do nights. And uh, didn't know what to name him. So I, I said, well, let's do something that stands out. Why don't you just be the new guy at night for a while? <laughs> he was the new guy for about four years before he went to kiss. <laughs> and that's, and that's was, where you came in. It is. That's absolutely where I came in. And so fortunate for that, uh, that experience. I learned so much and I, and I look back at my life in the business and how lucky I've been, I really revere that as the best time in my life. I just was fortunate enough to interview little Tommy uh, a couple weeks ago. And uh, he'd said of all the places that Jeff and Jer had gone, that the best time for him were the years that we all spent together at Star. It was a incredibly special time and just an amazing, an amazing staff. You think about where the people are now of that. So obviously Jeff and Jer, you know, on to becoming the, the Radio Hall of Fame. Uh, uh, as you mentioned, Greg Sims is doing care. Joe Cipriano is one of the biggest voiceover talent uh, on the planet. Um, Jagger and Christie, of course, uh, in- incredible success. Eddie Papani, he does mornings in San Diego. Michael works for War- Warner Brothers. Uh, I think Anita retired very wealthy because of her husband, if I recall, is a very wealthy uh, banker. Um, but uh, so many people just went on to have an incredible amount of success from that uh, from that station. Dave Smiley still doing mornings at ZPL, number in, one in uh, Indianapolis. Indianapolis. I mean, it's just uh, incredible. And so I, I thank you. And what uh, and I'd like to dig in deeper into Star. I could have a whole podcast just on that. But the <laughs> promotions that you put together and this creative side of your brain that Alan Burns was talking about, and I just got to hear about the way that you were the architect behind Q106, and I didn't know any of that story, and that was just in incredibly brilliant and creative, but whirl to your hurl, uh, the, uh, the stadium promotion where I can't remember what you called it, but everyone having battle a battle of the seat. butts, battle of the butts. It was too, uh, it's, it's amazing. I just found the parody song that we used for that the other day. It was on my computer. Uh, it was, did you really? I was tub thumping. That's right. And, it was, and, it was, and the theme was I sit right down, then I get up again and I move to the very next seat. 
<laughs> I also have to give credit to Tom Watts, who, in a b- brilliant imaging director, we mentioned he's at Sirius XM, but he is actually who really got me into the imaging production and my fascination with that side of the business. And I used to sit in his studio watching him create uh, amazing imaging and production, but I also used to listen on the voiceover sessions that Joe Cipriano used to do with him. And so that's where my passion came from all of that. Uh, but just what an amazing uh, crew and uh, w- what a run we had. And I will always look up, look back at that as my the, the best years of my radio career. Let's talk about how you segued uh, another first that you did. I think you were one of the first to do a loyalty program. I remember when we did uh, did that, what a huge deal that was. You were way ahead, uh, one of the first stations to have a website. Uh, that was also a huge, I mean, you were just a, a trendsetter really from the very get-go. And talking about kind of just seeing and reading the tea leaves, talk to me about your transition over into M2O, which then eventually became Triton. Well, it was 1998 and Reg Johns came to our station because Reg had his company here in San Diego, um, M2O Media. And he came in and, and showed me the software and said, you know, when you fly on an airplane, you get points. And when you earn points, you get rewards for it. And they get your information and they get your data. And the more that you, the, the, you invest with that uh, airline, the more rewards you get and the more money they make. Here's how it works. And I've got to come up with the same thing for radio stations. And it was the coolest thing I'd ever heard. I thought it was fantastic. And we shouldn't have done it. (laughs) 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 Because you go back to 1998, not everybody had an email address. Sure, we had email sure. addresses, but it was brand new. Not everybody was online. So the whole right. loyalty program was on floppy disks. In order to get people to play this, we had to program every day of our loyalty rewards program into a floppy disk a year in advance. Yeah. <laughs> and then we gave away the floppy disks. We would do van hits. I remember so, dropping off the floppy disks. So expensive. Disks. Yeah. One. And then the software didn't work well. <laughs> and there are people complaining. So we didn't, you know, it was, it was a logistics nightmare, but it got better. It ended up getting online in about 2000 and in four years from 1998 to 2002, we accumulated over 200,000 individual email addresses in our database. And Jeez. we knew a lot of things about these people. Sure. Uh, we knew what their favorite music was, what time of the day they listened, and things like that. By 2004, uh, technology had come along so far. Google existed by that time. And we were doing music testing online in 2004. The first, the first auditory music test we did online, we did it for a total cost of $500. Unreal. And this is the day when an auditory music test would set you back 30, 40 grand. Yes. We did, it cost us $500. We tested 600 songs. And we had over 2,000 people take the test of all 600 songs. Amazing. It was, it was, it was incredible. So, and, and it was all because the more they interacted with us, the more points they got. And the more points they got, we started directing prizes to that. And we made it a focal point. By 2004, we generated over a quarter of a million dollars in non-spot revenue in database marketing because we figured out how to sell that information. And this is, you know, six, six, 17 years ago. Yeah. I mean, this was a digital line of revenue, which every company now is so anxious to have and so proud to report. Uh, I know Town Square has been very successful with it. We just saw Intercom the other day change the name of the entire company to be more digital. But you were 17 years ago doing this, which is really mind boggling. So so as, after our success with it, and Scott Sands was doing it in Indianapolis too, and Scott was having success with the program. Reg wanted to really start marketing this and spreading it. And he had a relationship with Rogers Media in Canada. And he hired me to help him get that installed and to consult them with, with all, of the, uh, uh, all of the rollouts in Canada. So Reg and I got uh, developed a very close relationship. And in 2006, um, Triton uh, was putting together their empire. And Mike Agavino and Neil Shore came to San Diego to tell us all the wonderful things that uh, Triton was planning and try to sell us on some of their streaming products and things like that. And they were meeting with Gina Landau, our our director of sales. I was the general manager at the time. I became general manager of the stations in 98. And so they're meeting with, they were, they were meeting with Gina and she said, you should talk to Tracy about this. This is, he talks about this database stuff. And so she brought me into the meeting and I started showing them what we were doing with our, our database and with loyalty marketing and how we're generating revenue from it. And they wanted to meet Reg. 
And so I connected them with Reg and a few months later they bought Reg's company on the condition that I would be a part of the purchase and come to work for them. And <laughs> you, by the way, another probably the third time you were incredibly instrumental in my life, but you brought me on because I was fresh out of losing my gig as the program director of my FM here in LA. And you hired me and was a life-saving, but B, a huge learning experience for myself as that kind of transition into digital. And it all worked out incredibly well and gave me this uh, amazing parachute to then eventually transition into Benstown. Well, yeah, the timing uh, was, was terrific, right? Because you were looking for something to do. You had a big name in the industry, had a lot of success working with Clear Channel at, um, at, at KBIG. Everybody knew who you were. And we were rolling out these loyalty programs all across the country. So, and, and I knew that we'd work well together. Uh, we could finish each other's sentences. So, uh, so it was, it was just natural to, uh, to, to make that happen. Yeah, uh, it was, and I greatly appreciate that. And, uh, yeah, as I think about it, three huge monumental times in my life, you've, uh, you've been such a huge influence. And then from there, uh, before we get into the next transition into your career, tell us a little bit about the books because throughout your career, you've written now three books and, uh, I'd love to, uh, kind of, uh, talk about where that came from and, and why you decided to do it. Well, I wrote three books and I've, I've got 24 eBooks now that, uh, Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, in addition to they're shorter and they're, and they're, and they're themed. The, the book started in, um, do you remember Pedro Mosquito? Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, he was uh, he was part time, and he could just I just never had a full position for him on on the air at Star. He was at Q one hundred six, and then at Star, he just didn't have a full time position for him. He had some friends in Salt Lake City, and he was uh, he had, he had just moved to Boise. I had written a handbook for what Star one hundred point seven would be, and a lot of that handbook was based on the philosophies that Alan Burns had taught me. So I took all of these things that Alan had taught me about personality and promotion and format, and I put it into a handbook that was specific to the code of conduct and what our, what our playbook was at Star. And we had meetings about it. We had quizzes about it. We had, it, was, it was pretty detailed. And Pedro took that playbook with him to Boise, where he met someone who ended up in Salt Lake City. And Alan Haig from Salt Lake City called me one day and said, hey, I got this playbook. I have a couple of questions about it. I said, you got a playbook? What, what playbook? You know, it's the Star 100.7 playbook, and I'm putting on a similar station here. Where did you get it? And so I tracked <laughs> it back down through Pedro and given him a copy of it. And I, th I thought, if they're going to start making copies and circulating this through the industry, I'm going to get paid for it. Yeah. <laughs> as you should. So I contacted Alan. I contacted Alan because so much of it was things that Alan taught me. Uh, I mean, the, the, Alan not only taught me that, I had, I had memos that we had written to stations that I took a lot of that information from. So I called Alan and he said, look, I'm thinking about right, taking this, this playbook that I made and putting it into a book form, but you should be co-author of this. And he said, yeah, tell me what, what you want me to do. And I said, well, let me write it and I'll put your name on it. And we'll market it together. So I wrote the whole thing. He proofread it, made some adjustments. And the first book, Morning Radio, came out in 1996. And Alan and I co-authored it. It's the first book of its kind. And we ended up on the NAB and the, the, all these panels and seminars and morning show boot camp. And we ended up selling, gosh, 4,500 copies or so in countries all over the world, much, much more than I ever expected. And that led to a group of stations in Australia that hired me to consult them while I was still, I was running Star and KFMB and I was consulting this group in Australia and that led to New Zealand and I was speaking in, in Sweden and, and all of these places. So, I mean, again, right place at the right time. And uh, it all it all happened because that little DJ t stole my book. But <laughs> and we should give Pedro another person under your tutelage who's gone on to amazing success. Most people probably know him as Mikey Fuentes, who has been incredibly instrumental in Tino Cacino's success. Yes. Uh, not only was he uh, it turned out to be a great programmer and a very good on-air talent. I think he uh, uh, Mikey programmed in Boise as well as yeah. I believe Phoenix for a while. And uh, now uh, Tino has just been on fire the last couple of years and. So so impressive. Well, and you know, I, I haven't, and I haven't talked to Mikey for a while, but uh, I think he had a similar uh, awakening where he realized he wasn't as good on the air as he is a program director. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> the same awakening I had. <laughs> and, and, and that's awesome. Yeah. Nobody can sit you down and tell you that you've got to kind of discover it for yourself and say, oh, this is what I'm really good at. This is what I'm meant to be. I'm also not meant to be, unfortunately, a uh, PGA uh, tour player. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me about Tracy Johnson Media Group. And you're so incredibly active uh, with your webinars and your personality magnet program and your newsletters. Uh, how did you uh, end up transitioning into that and really going back to consulting full time? Well, once again, you know, things happen uh, and opportunities uh, come up. And it was 2011 and the, I was um, at Triton and working with uh, about 250 radio stations in North America on their digital and connecting what we do on the air to what we do off the air with digital and working with all departments inside the station. And in the course of about a month, uh, one of my clients in Calgary working for Bell Media had just hired a new morning show that they were having trouble with. And they started asking me questions about it. And they finally said, would you consult our morning show? Because we need to fix this. And I hadn't really thought about it. And I thought, well, maybe. Yeah. And the same month I got a call from local media, San Diego here. They had just divided the company and were starting to put their own management team together. And the general manager here, Greg Wolfson, wanted me to come and be the uh, vice president of uh, programming for this new company he was forming. Both of those things happened in the same month. And I thought, there's an opportunity here. So I said yes to the consulting gig. And I went and met with Greg and said, look, I won't come to work for you. But how about if I consult you and I'll keep an office in your station and I'll help you help you get your programming going in the right direction. And so we worked that out, and that was the foundation for starting the Tracy Johnson Media Group. And what an incredible foundation. And that also, from there, you helped uh, move, correct me if I'm wrong, but Mark and Christy over to Magic. You were instrumental in bringing on R-Dub over at uh, Z90 and Magic, which... Well, and I only knew R-Dub because you introduced me to him yeah. when I came <laughs> out to see you in L.A., and you took me down to meet the, uh, the, the Slow Jams guy. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure if that's something you're gonna. Uh, you're gonna you thank me for, or hate me for. But I'm uh, glad it's worked out. No, he's he's, uh, he's incredible. He's made me look good more times than more times than not. Yeah, and he uh, he absolutely loves it down there. He was just up here on Monday, and we had lunch together. And uh, he's just having the time of his life. And what a great company LMA is. I've got so much respect for Greg and the team that you guys have assembled down there. And so now, not only are you working with stations, but you also work with a lot of talent, like Free Beer and Hot Wings. And talk about some of the talent that you work with as well. Uh, yeah, like you said, Free Beer and Hot Wings, a great talk show on uh, rock stations out of uh, Grand Rapids. Uh, we're on about 70 stations now, I think it is. Uh, they're, they're doing extremely well. Uh, Didi in the morning in uh, Dallas and also syndicated. I think we're up over 50 on Didi's network now. And that, that network's just a couple of years old. Uh, so that I've been working with them for about seven years. I work with uh, Beasley in Boston on uh, the three stations. I got a classic hits, throwbacks, an R&B, and a country station there. Really proud of what all three of those stations are doing. Working with Bonneville in San Francisco, you know, here in San Diego. And I'm working in some small markets too. And some of the most fun I'm having is in some of the smaller markets. I, I work with a, a, a small group in Nebraska called Flood Communications. Uh -huh. and I met them when I was consulting KQKQ a few years ago. The, the market manager ended up going to be the uh, CEO for Flood Communications. And they own stations in all these tiny markets through Nebraska and maybe a little bit in Iowa. Um, and one of their stations is in Norfolk, Nebraska, Norfolk, uh, home of Johnny Carson. Uh, that's their claim to fame. It's spelled Norfolk, but you pronounce it Norfolk. Got it. Uh, so I'm not mispronouncing it when I say Norfolk. That's how they, what they call it. Norfolk, Nebraska, it's a little town of 23,000 people. And they hired me to consult them. Very provincial, very much into their communities and local community service. And Mike Flood's the owner of the company, and he told me that the one thing I want is to have a radio station that makes my community proud. Help me make it that. And this past year in COVID, where every station is down some as much as 65, 70, 80 percent in revenue, they were up. Amazing. They were up for over a year in this, past, in, in this past year because they've got those roots in the community and what they mean. And, and that, that's, that's been really satisfying. It's exciting to work with them. I'm sure. And it's got to be neat 
for it to come back full circle and be working back in your home state again. In, yeah, that's in a small market. I, 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 you know, it's uh, it, it's fun because I understand the lifestyle. I know uh, I, I know what the people are like there. I know what the values are, and I know what makes them tick. What advice do you have now uh, for people getting into our business? I know it's obviously incredibly tough circumstances at the moment, but I think it's so vitally important that we're trying to uncover the next generation of programmers and air talent and people that want to follow in our footsteps. Number one thing is to find someone who will allow you to be successful not just to execute a format, but allow you to really be successful and be creative. Uh, the, 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 the reason for my success came because of working with great people, being lucky enough to hire great people that would make me look good, but also working for companies that let us create. At Q106, we did it out of desperation. I told you that story that we were going to get fired unless we did something. So let's go, let's go out in a ball of flame. And it was a very creative time because we had nothing to lose. Because if, if, if we didn't succeed, with this, it was going to end badly anyway. So let's take the shot. At Star, we were owned by a family out of Champaign, Illinois, Midwest Communications or Midwest Television. Uh, not Midwest Communications, different company, Midwest Television. And they gave full autonomy to my boss in San Diego, Ed Trimble. And Ed's whole philosophy was you don't get better by not taking chances. So to get something done, if I wanted to do a multimedia marketing campaign, I would walk down the hall and talk to Ed. And if I, he would ask a lot of questions, but if I could support it, he'd give the green light. And that was the decision, whether it was budgeted or not. And so we were able to do anything we wanted to do as long as it made sense. And it didn't have to go through all these layers of corporate sign-up. So find a situation where you can have that in whatever part of broadcasting you want to be in, whether it's as a manager, as a program director, as a talent, find a situation where you can bet on yourself and be responsible for your own success and take accountability in case you fail. Great advice. And when you were talking about the the first female morning show that you put on, I caught that you took full responsibility for that failure because you had two responders and didn't have someone that could lead the show. And I think that's so incredibly important and having that kind of uh, ownership. And uh, another thing I want to kind of ask you and we're in this obviously change, uh, monumental change in our life and shift from the pandemic and so many things shifting in our industry. Where do you think things are going now uh, as we go into the future and uh, Intercom just changes their name to Odyssey? What's kind of your prediction and guess? I don't know where it's going to go. I know where I would like to see it go. And I would like to see it get to be get to the point where radio becomes so desperate that we try new things. And I think we're going to get there because radio stations can't continue to be successful by tweaking their format and compete for a ever shrinking uh, music pie uh, where the, the industry is measuring its success. My station against your station for total listening because the share still adds up to 100. But the number of people who are actually using radio and the amount of time those people are spending with radio continues to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And music isn't going to separate that because you're going to play commercials. I wrote an article last week about how YouTube faces the same challenges that radio stations face, where YouTube's doing a lot of surveys and they're showing that the commercials they play before showing you a video are driving their viewers absolutely crazy to where they're not wanting to watch videos on YouTube anymore. Those commercials are 15 seconds. So I was having this conversation with a VP of programming the other day. I said, hey, you know, uh, did you see my article on YouTube? They hadn't seen it. And I said, well, you know, uh, YouTube is finding that the commercials they play before those videos are really a deterrent and it's costing them a lot of time spent viewing. And the VP of programming goes off saying it's the most annoying thing in the world. I don't even go to YouTube anymore because I have to sit through all those commercials in order to get to the video I want to see. Wow. I stopped him. I said, when's the last time you listened to your radio station? <laughs> Great question. What are audio listeners going through? If the attention span is so short that they're not putting up at those 15 seconds to before they can hit skip ad to get to the content that they seek out and choose, 
how much patience do they have on the radio to hear a Justin Bieber song, which I can hear anywhere that's disposable. Or so we do games, we do tricks, we do contests, we do promotions to try and trick people into listening longer. And that works to an extent, but only with the people who are already using radio. We need to bring people back into radio for specific reasons. And that's only going to come from one place. And that's by putting unique content on that they can't get anywhere else. And that comes from the personalities. Personality radio is the only hope radio stations have of making this business work in the long term. Otherwise, it's going to be just a commodity that promotes their other business. Man, so absolutely well put. And I couldn't agree with you anymore. And I am so grateful for not only everything that you've done for me and my career, but all the talent that you've helped and for just going out there and spreading the gospel about our business. And I I hope that people take uh, and really listen to what you say, because I think you're 100% correct, that we really have to move the needle by putting on great personalities, great talent, and uh, not rely on the music as much as we have in the in the past. So, Tracy, thank you so much, man, for uh, joining me. This has been just uh, a pleasure and uh, always love catching up with you. Uh, really quickly, just uh, plug where everyone can uh, sign up for your newsletters and learn more about your webinars. You can get me at uh, tjohnsonmediagroup.com. Thank you so much, Tracy. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Chachi. It was fun. Good to see you.